Cookies, the most influential basketball podcast. I am Ben Dietrich. Jordan Ridelli is on vacation. Fortunately, Andrew Quo has been sitting in his chair for, at this point, a month and a half straight. That's right. Just waiting for that one three. And I nailed it. You know, it's a make or miss league. And <laughs> you made it. You nailed it. You you were there shooting in the gym, and you had your big moment, and you drilled it. And now I'm proceed. I'm gonna proceed to just dunk for the rest of my life. That's it for three, the three. I love it. You know, take the three. It's light work. Easy. Get back to what works, which is dunking. Show people you can do it. Move along. You did it. That was like all it to- took. I don't like to get fouled. I don't like people touching me. I'm kind of a germaphobe. I just like to launch long distance shots with people far away from me. It's anti-social. I understand that. Yeah, I've always thought with those personality quizzes, you're you know kind of an introvert. So this makes <laughs> sense. How antisocial are you? Do you like threes? Yes. <laughs> you are new metal. Well, anyway, welcome listeners to a very special episode of Cookies Hoops. I don't know why it's very special, but I have a feeling feeling it's going to be extra special and even more perfect than normal. Hmm. Hmm. What's going on, Andrew Quo? Nothing, man. I'm just following this China stuff. It's a country that's close to Japan and kind of a little below Russia. So your your interest in this is purely geographical. That's right. Uh, It's map-based. Sort of Mm -hmm. like there's New York City, L.A. is around somewhere, and then China's like really far away at the other end of the earth. I've always thought of your approaches being sort of a cartographical. Is that a word? Cartographical? Yeah, sure. I feel like it ties into cartography. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Map-based. Yeah, I have trouble like remembering things. So when I was little, I would just draw them out so I could remember them better. And uh, lo and behold, decades later, that's all I do. It's true. Your job is basically drawing maps of fictional, um, I don't know, Atlantis-like structures. (laughs) That's right. Just Uh, various Edenic Xanadus. (laughs) Um, Next time we go to the garden, are you going to hold up a sign that is pro-Hong Kong? I would love to. No, but I, all right. So here's my thing. Let's familiarize our our listeners a little bit with this whole imbroglio that's unfolding. Wow. Over in the Far East. Nice. Is that is that politically correct? The Far East. No, I was. Call it that? I was thinking about imbroglio. Oh yes, it's, that's politically correct. Mm. I believe. Mm. So anyway, the NBA has found itself between a rock and a hard place after Daryl Morey the Houston Rockets general manager made a absent sort of bland tweet supporting the protests in Hong Kong. Bland for us. But I mean, bland overall, it wasn't like a statement that he seemed to put like a lot of thought into. It wasn't particularly vociferous. It was just kind of a support, support these guys. Exactly. It was like blue lives matter. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those type of things. Mm -hmm. And it, engulfed the entire league and Asian subcontinent is it the Asian subcontinent in flames (laughs) my thing here is I still don't know who I'm supposed to be rooting for it's kind of like succession like there's no there's no like good guy here yeah man I agree Um, but go on I mean you, you caught me off guard with succession but God, I'm not rooting for anybody on that show. But I'm kind of rooting for both parties. Go go off, King. Do your thing. I don't even have a particular take. I'm trying to set you up to go off, sire. (laughs) I'm saying for some lord shit. Yes, I want lord shit. (laughs) And I'm not just sticking you with this duty because you're the person with Chinese 
roots. I just think you probably know more about this than me. Barely, but, um, and my parents were really involved in all this stuff when they, you know, when they were our age. And um, it, it reminded me of, it reminded me of, to be honest, like what happened in 1989 in Tiananmen Square and how, sh- how shocking to us Americans, uh, even as immigrants from that country, my, uh, speaking for myself, um, how, how jarring sometimes their policy is and how, um, how little space there is for nuance. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to say a, a really bland statement, a more yes statement in that, like, I really love America and I think it's such oh, a great country. Thank God. <laughs> I'm so glad that you came out with this. Um, <laughs> oh, all right. So you heard it here first. Yeah. Quo and, loves America. And that's not a really popular thing to say in our, maybe in our circles that much, but I think there's things that we take for granted here that seem normal where uh, Daryl Morey voices his support for a democratic faction of a country um, and where Joseph Tsai has to come in and kind of just give a lay of the land and I thought Joseph Tsai's response to Mori's statement was measured and he does a lot of business in mainland China through Alibaba and now he's the owner majority owner of the Nets and he just quickly ran down the history of what Hong Kong is and how it was acquired by a foreign country and how China always felt like it was uh, a place that was rightfully theirs and eventually would assimilate it back into their own country. But a lot changes in that process and people start living lives and create relationships through business and family and uh, politics. And 2047, big mood. Yeah. And that's scary, right? Because you have examples of China, like in 1989 with Tiananmen Square, that make you pause a little bit about human rights and all these things that are really tough to talk about because it's it has existed longer than democracy, um, which is a pretty young idea anyway. And America is a really young country compared to China. And they're almost the same way the current White House is, like, just let us handle our own business. The interesting thing with this whole debate is business, because when China opened their doors kind of to the West and we started trading and uh, interacting in new ways in the business sector, it created very complicated relationships. And with the NBA, there is a connection to that country through the Rockets and Yao Ming and even Jeremy Lin a little bit. The Rockets even designed their jerseys to look like Chinese characters and the color red. And the whole identity is based on their popularity in that country. And that generates billions of dollars for the NBA. And the NBA is a money-making company. It's not like uh, what we think politicians do where it's, it's... almost a part of our ether and a part of our philosophy. The NBA is a for-profit company. It is no different than the big three, other than it's just more successful and popular. Um, So I think these are things that we have to consider when we criticize Maury Stern or people who are asked to remove signs from a game. But it's not like we can walk into Barclays Center and hold up a sign that says, Giuliani for president. We just can't do that. We would ask to be removed, probably, or to put that sign away. I think the interesting situation is tied to the moral relativism that comes into play when you do business with China or other countries that have different governmental systems, including ones where the economic system and the government are deeply enmeshed together. And it's one thing when it's manufacturing, right? When you're getting your products made somewhere and it's a simple transaction. And then people might say, we don't like this is hap- we don't like that you're doing business with this country and that situation might change. But the NBA is in a very thorny dilemma because if you blow off China, you're blowing off 15% of your of your salary cap of your market. It's a huge part of their business plan. But at the same time, you can't necessarily outsource 
freedom of speech. You can't say we're going to hold our employees to the standards that China holds its employees. And China, on the other hand, says if you want access to our billions and billions of people, you play by our rules. And to me, this is just kind of a flex. The Chinese people didn't see Daryl Morey, the GM for the Rockets, who put up a tweet on a social media network that is not in China for a couple minutes. It was not seen. This was a flex by the government to make a point that you play by our rules when you are making money in our house. Yeah, and there was an update to that today, right? Uh, there was word that uh, the U.S. was reconsidering its sanctions on China and maybe even like gaming the value of the dollar, which is really confusing, and I was trying to wrap my head around it. But this all happened today, this morning, uh, on Thursday. And this is directly related to the debate about the NBA and um, the market share that foreign countries have in other countries. When this dilemma first sort of appeared, I, my response was kind of, as I had mentioned before, that I don't know that there's a good guy in this entire situation. There's no one that I'm rooting for. Everyone's kind of compromised. Are you but sure? as time was, well, I mean, I don't I mean, I don't know. I'm saying like the compromise of like the NBA can take a firm moral stand and say, we're going to chop out a huge part of our business, or they're going to say our employees have to do what China wants, I, you know, even though they're in America. I, I just mean, there was no one that I'm like, the NBA's right. Like, is Daryl Morey right? I don't know. He's still an employee for these companies. Is China right to like bully American citizens who are criticizing their government? Like, I, there's no one I really am necessarily planting a flag for. But as the days went by, I realized that this is funny. Hmm. It went from being serious and weird to just being funny. Which seems to be a lot of politics these days, right? I mean... It's, it's hilarious. You have the NBA forced to make these ridiculous twisting statements to try to somehow appease everyone from AOC to Ted Cruz on one side while not alienating the Chinese government on the other. You have players sitting around and refusing to talk about politics. You have people with signs in arenas and guys making $12 an hour who are worried about like taking public transportation home or forced to come over and like remove their signs and get, you know, put up on YouTube as like enforcing draconian rules. It's like the whole thing is just drifted into the surreal at this point. Yeah, you have the president of the United States mocking Steve Kerr at a press conference. It, it, it definitely seems surreal, but I, I don't I don't think it's funny and I will plant my flag on the side of Maury, um, and... I mean, yes, yes, that, that is who I would side with and that he is an American citizen making a statement about a foreign country and he should not be crucified for doing that. Yeah, I agree. and I, I'm not going far out there, you know, respect to the great country of China, but I, I kind of stand with Hong Kong here as well. And um, what's going on there is really... It's been brewing for centuries and generations, and um, I'm American, so that's where my point of view comes from. But I think the the concern of the Hong, the citizens of Hong Kong, uh, are real and should be discussed. And there is no discussion, so they're angry. And watching it unfold is terrifying because we watched this in 1989, where there was a peaceful demonstration in Tiananmen Square, and we all know what happened. And I think that is like an atrocity that hasn't been discussed enough in the West. How that went down was truly horrific, I, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, that's a really tough accusation to make because they've lived in this bubble for so, so long. And uh, the Cultural Revolution is a very complicated thing that I'm not even equipped to dissect in terms of a basketball podcast. But um, the, you're totally right. The NBA part of it seems comical. The human rights part of it seems like it will take a lifetime to understand. Yeah, I'm not saying... China as a state is funny. I'm saying the mess that the NBA has found itself in with its players in China and avoiding questions and not doing media and people apparently not attending the game, but they're 
allegedly going to go through with the exhibition there anyway. Like the whole thing is just such a mess. Yeah. But it's revealing as well because we're seeing the real face of business and how, uh, you know, we really congratulate Kerr and Popovich 2020, the, the 2020 ticket for speaking their mind and their thoughts kind of align with cookies, right? Uh, the things that they've said, I have no problems with at all about agency, about uh, protecting our players, about um, racism, uh, about all these things. Like I generally can get on board with most of the things they say, um, but they they definitely fell back because they're a part of a bigger company. And the truth is, like we don't know enough about China. That's a really that's not something that has been in our rhetoric for a while. Uh, I'm not even sure how to talk about the Middle East succinctly, right? Um, I know about the conflicts there, but I don't know about the nuance of it. I know the Knicks are bad, but we know why the Knicks are bad. I don't know why things are happening to a degree of like uh, an Alonzo Trier-esque like detail, you know what I mean? So Kerr doesn't feel agency to say anything, and then the guy in the White House jumps all over him. I think the guy in the White House thinks Kerr's actually running for president. There's a, at least a 5% chance of that, right? I mean, I don't know, maybe 5%? I, I He's like, know, I've seen the, those T-shirts. <laughs> I don't know what the, the handicap is on that. But it is funny with someone like Kerr, who has been very outspoken and very eloquent in, in stating a concern for humanity and politics and civil rights, to then, in this situation basically fall back and say, I'm just trying to learn. I'm trying to learn, man. Like, you know, and I think it would be great if people would ask him like in a couple of days, like, what have you learned mm. during this period? You know, have you now, can you make a statement, you know, that you've taken this period to learn or is this an indefinite learning period? Like I've just got to learn for the rest of my life about this. And I, it's such a process that I'll never actually be able to make a statement because I'm learning every day, like a human. <laughs> You know, right. when do you, when does someone stop learning? And there's politics between asking that question and answering that question. I, I, I'm waiting to see uh, a member of the media actually do that because that would be truly interesting. But I don't think it's going to happen. Right. And again, there is no good place for Kerr to go or Pop to go unless they just say, you know what, I'm going to voice my opinion and the league be damned. But I think everyone saw how harsh the response was from not only China, but from the league towards Daryl Morey. I mean, they essentially threatened his job. And that was what drew everyone outside of the NBA into the equation where they're like, wait, 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 wait. You sided with China here yeah. and you and you made Morey come like kowtowing with like, a, you know, not necessarily an apology per se, but reach walk back his statements and, you know, released a statement in China that was very different from the one that they released here. And I think for good reason, the most outspoken guys in the NBA are very wary of being dragged into this for no reason. And this is a larger discussion about identity. And I think in previous generations, we kind of kept religion and politics personal. And it wasn't as overt to know what affiliation politically a uh, famous person had but now I think you know our brains have changed and um, with uh, that uh, the line to the, how the internet kind of creates how we view ourselves as people and where we stand on issues and it's odd to see someone recoil like that because the upside of discussing China is really low. The upside of being like, support the troops, I hate racism is really high. And you can really align yourself easily with those ideas because the pushback doesn't quite exist. But with China, the pushback is real. And you're talking about actual money. I don't think any, I don't think companies or people actually suffer economically by saying like, I support all people. Right. Like there's the threat of boycott. But in the end, I don't think Chick-fil-A is doing that bad. And China is an anomaly in that it is such a huge, huge part of the NBA's business. And the NBA 
really can't afford or probably can't afford or really does not want to afford alienating that market. As people descri- described, it might... They have no problems with it, that market. The market's might make, nice. Yeah. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's like to have the government come in and be like, all right, you got to play by our rules. And the NBA is like, well, people like basketball. They're into it. We've put this work into it. Yeah, your fans into are cultivating amazing. it. We yeah. love the fans. We love sending people there. It's 15% of our salary cap. It's awesome. Right. And they're like, it, now we have to do what? Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, you ruined something that was going so well. Like the dates were going so well. We like, everyone was getting along. Everyone was laughing. And people were like, I'm a Republican. It's like, why'd you have to say that? <laughs> but right. um, I mean, ultimately, I don't care at all about the NBA's business. I, I care about the players being rewarded mm-hmm. financially for their contributions. But I do not care if 30 billionaires and their assorted cabals of henchmen <laughs> are making less money. Sure. Because their yeah. relationship with China fractured. Like, I just don't give a fuck. Well, could we go into conspiracy theory land where Nate Silver, a few, right when this happened, he was like, Can I offer the idea that maybe Maury, after taking on Westbrook's contract, is kind of sabotaging the salary cap by eliminating all this revenue that they receive in China and lowering the cap so he doesn't have to? to pay the the spiritual and financial penalty of taking on Westbrook. Um, it's kind of interesting, though. It, no, but kind of it's going to be in effect if if I'm the NBA loses by, that money. But I'm confused by how that would work. I, I saw that same tweet, and I vaguely thought about it and immediately discounted it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, no. But it's what, fun does that, what does that mean, though? Because if the cap lowers, they'll be further over the cap, correct? I'm sure there's going to be some sort of grandfathering in of taxation with players that you already have if they do lower the tax. I'm not quite sure about that, but um, that would make most sense to me. But if teams aren't allowed to spend as much money, does Morty have an advantage moving forward? Okay, that part, of, that way that makes sense. It wasn't about luxury tax. N- it's about I mean, just having a... It's never about luxury it's about It's about having committed money. Yes. And saying yes. we've got X amount of committed money other teams won't be able to get to that level yeah. in terms of committed money and will have more money yeah. than to spend yeah. and move around. That yeah. that argument makes sense. I don't believe that this was Daryl Morey's thought process in any iota, mm. but I like the idea that it could be strategic. Yeah, even it's I mean, not. not no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and Morey is like a thoughtful guy who like speaks with like, I, I really appreciate how generous he is. Like, even in the playoffs when the Rockets get eliminated, he kind of pokes fun at himself. And he's angry. He's not, he doesn't mock himself. He's just like, we really tried hard, guys. But back to the drawing board, you know, respect to the Warriors. And he speaks like a human being, which I appreciate. And sometimes, I'll admit, Popovich and Kerr seem robotic. Um, that's true. I mean, Maury also if I remember correctly, said that he was going to vote for Mitt Romney over Barack Obama. So Yes, yeah, yeah. I don't know if Maury is necessarily the, uh, I don't know, the, the sort of liberal legend that he's kind of being made out to be here anyway. Yeah, I mean, boomers really want nerds to be liberal, but the truth is nerds are probably split 50-50. Yeah, and I remember, I could be wrong, but I felt like when... Um, one of the that employer from Google got fired and the sort of disruptive tech guys were angry because it was sort of viewed as policing this guy's thoughts and this guy's thoughts sucked <laughs> and he was fired for him. I do kind of remember Maury putting up like a reference to 1984 that he didn't directly say it was about that situation, but that's what a lot of people kind of on the, the tech side were saying and I kind of side-eyed it. I was like, oh, he's he's making a little statement here indirectly that most people aren't going to get. But I think, and again, I could be absolutely wrong, it was kind of a nod to that dude who got fired from Google. Yeah. and I wish I could describe that that firing better in different terms, but I haven't even thought about it since it happened. You bring up a really good point with that because in its – and it's definitely related to the way the NBA exists globally and the way we see certain famous people like uh, Daryl Morey and some celebrities. 
I think the more you know about somebody, eventually something's going to conflict with the way you think about something. And there's no way the NBA can align themselves at every bullet point with how everyone thinks. And eventually we're going to get to a point where we're so involved in knowing what kind of human Maury is, where we're going to say, but I hate musicals. And that's, that is always a divide with somebody who has too many eyes on them, is the minute something conflicts with a popular or maybe a group idea, it's easy to criticize the person's ideas that you had agreed with previously. It's also very easy to take the moral high ground and be performatively woke or legitimately woke when it dovetails with your financial interests. When the NBA is juxtaposing itself with the NFL, which is barbaric and <laughs> primitive and racist and a garbage can of a sport, <laughs> the NBA looks great. They look progressive. We don't hate gays. We like everybody. Our players can take stands. Here's a salary That's, cap for you. <laughs> exactly. But it's like the NBA fans are younger. The NBA fans are more progressive. When you're doing things that appeal to your fans, that helps your brand. When presented with a conundrum with Daryl Morey in China, the NBA did not come off like a particularly woke organization or one that really cared about, I don't know, civil rights, yeah. human rights, freedom of speech. They very distinctly went the other direction, like, like hard body. And they ended up having to go back on that. But they went very hard, like, pro-China. They didn't even weigh it off the bat. I know. The NFL is like, feel our pain. <laughs> for, for sure. And it was one of the first times in Adam Silver's tenure that the NBA has had to make a decision between public-facing morality and their bottom line. And we know which way they chose to go. And this is such an interesting thing, especially with the the gross stuff that comes out of the White House. It's almost like the people who actually care about the NBA probably don't care that much about this, but people who don't care about the NBA are just going right in and attacking them on every level, right? Because they don't enjoy it in the same way. It's sort of like if you don't like politics, this is a really delicious thing to make fun of this White House, which is way too easy. But if you're really immersed in politics, you're like, oh, this is kind of serious and like a lot more complicated than it seems. As I said, I did not have and do not have any strong feelings about this. If you do a lot of business with China, you're going to run into this scenario mm -hmm. in which they will try to censor things you say by using their economic muscle. Like that's just the deal. Mm -hmm. And you can take it or leave it. And I don't really feel that the NBA is bad for doing this. I don't feel like they're good if they didn't. I just, that's the deal. And you can negotiate that however you want, NBA. Yeah, exactly. And we love the NBA. And I can only speak for myself, Ben. I love the NBA. but uh, You love America. You love the <laughs> NBA. I do. And which are not two popular opinions, actually. Loving uh, they're the probably NBA is, Who doesn't love the NBA? I mean, every single person. In America. <laughs> right. Um but I and, used to love the NBA, but then they started allowing all those travels. <laughs> it's just traveling and traveling. And then I realized that I actually like college basketball. I realized they were lying to us about height and shoe size. I and, hate how they get paid. Yeah. What are you saying? Shoes give a player another inch. That's that's dishonest. This is a bit. <laughs> it's the dishonest height tism a bit. That's just the traveling, man, and the carrying. Always with the carrying, their hand sliding up the side of the basketball. What Unbelievable. What are boomers going to do now that their Ben Simmons needs to shoot a three-bit is over? It's just now that he's their overlord, he's their Yeah, sire. it's crazy. For two years, we've seen the boomers, you know, filling their dipes over <laughs> Ben Simmons' lack of the three-ball, and now... They have to give up the bit. 
they're just like wandering around aimlessly being like zion needs to shoot a three Harden travels that's a travel uh he's not really seven feet it's just like a like a george romero movie it's a bunch the, of zombies in a mall looking for something to looking for another uh bit to buy the boomers have been trolling us with their fictitious ben simmons needs to shoot threes <laughs> gambit for for you know two full seasons i i feel bad for them like where are they going to go from here zion I mean, is their next one that's true they do have an angle they can go mm-hmm. with zion who who is really spitting in the eye of of <laughs> Of, of America, <laughs> of America, of, of the America we love, of propane fueled grills, of Mini riding fridges, lawnmowers, sriracha. Isn't that the most American thing? Spicy ketchup. I mean, he's basically taking a large poop on the <laughs> carpeted floor of every man cave in America. <laughs> right. Come he's, on, Zion. He's tearing Shoot down three, those fat heads. <laughs> you coward. Take a three. <laughs> Yo, his shot clock, uh, his shot chart was amazing. <laughs> very, very ethical. It was just dunks, man. He's going to be super fun. I hope I hope he draws the ire that Ben Simmons does, but he won't because he's more of a nerd. He's not as handsome. He's not, um, what did I call him on Twitter? Uh, a nerd with a popular kid v- swagger. With Zion is not popular. kid leaping ability? Yeah. No, Zion, he, Zion's just a sweetheart. Yeah, he's not going to date a Kardashian. The Ben Simmons situation is really unique because we are not unaccustomed to seeing big guys who can't really shoot but are good at dribbling and passing. We, there's LeBron James before he became a better shooter. But there's Giannis who can't shoot a lick. There's Draymond who can't shoot a lick. Like, we've seen these guys. This is, mm-hmm. this is a thing. Mm-hmm. Big, mobile dudes who are great passers and not good at hitting perimeter jumpers. It's not a unique archetype. It's fairly unique, but it's not unprecedented. There's a bunch of those guys. Going back, Anthony Mason, you know, Lamar Odom. Like this is a this is a prototype. And um but why does Ben Simmons receive so much hatred in comparison to those other guys is a little bit mystifying. I think it's a perfect storm. I think it's cultural and that means generational with entertainment. Kardashians, music, uh, kind of disposition, but also it's a subtle reaction to the analytics movement where it's funny how boomers all of a sudden value the three-point shot more than nerds do, but the nerds were the ones that were saying that was the way to beat good teams, take more valuable shots if you can. And when we turn around and say, well, Ben Simmons is not good at taking threes. Therefore, he should concentrate on what he's great at. It's confusing. And I think it's a generational shift. And I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about the way we think about it. Because the most boomer people on earth could be 18. Yes. And boomerism is really conventional wisdom. It may be retrograde, but it's mm-hmm. really steeped in conventional wisdom. Mm-hmm. And it's not based on having a strong understanding of conventional wisdom, but just subscribing to its tenets, which in this case are, you got to shoot threes. And there's no understanding of, to your point, high value shots. There's no understanding of how spacing actually works. It's just, you got to shoot threes. Spacing. Got to do it. Spread the floor. The phrase, keeping defenses honest, sounds very attractive. (laughs) And it's like, show me how they're honest. Like, well, they're following him. I'm like, that's not honesty. (laughs) Oh, man. The phrase you used before, though, perfect storm in regards to Ben Simmons is really true. And to me, and I've said this many times, so I'm sure I'm going to be boring. But this is not about basketball. This is about feelings. It's about emotions. (laughs) And Ben Simmons makes people feel a certain way. There are people in the media and people who are fans, and probably players around the league, etc. There are people who dislike Ben Simmons for a variety of reasons that don't have that much to do with basketball. He's arrogant. He blew off his, his uh, freshman year at LSU. He pals around with LeBron. He dates an Instagram billionaire. There, he comes off as, as frigid and kind of bitchy. 
he's definitely cooler than you in his public presence. He's not a man of the people. So there are reasons that people dislike him. In Philadelphia, there was a perception that he wanted to go to the Lakers and that he still kind of wants to play somewhere else, despite the fact that he's re-upped to a five-year max contract. So there were reasons for people not to like him. Then it's difficult to criticize him. He won Rookie of the Year. He was a 22-year-old All-Star. He's the best player out of the last three draft classes. He's on pace for a Hall of Fame career. The team has won over 50 games both seasons of his life. So what do you criticize? If you're lucky, though, the guy has a flaw like can't like the inability to shoot. And it's like this perfect conduit for all these feelings about Ben Simmons. And all of a sudden, his inability to shoot takes on a moral component. He's a bad shooter or won't shoot because he's a coward or he's fearful or he doesn't respect the game or the fans or he won't work on it. He's lazy. He's preoccupied with MySpace starlets. Or There's he's selfish these... on the court and he doesn't help his teammates win by doing things that would help them win games even though they've reached the pinnacle of the league. Exactly. So his lack of interest in taking outside shots dovetailed with boomer conventional wisdom, but also the seething dislike of him that existed already. And it did really become a perfect storm. The amount of attention dedicated to his lack of interest in taking threes doesn't make any sense. It's all feelings. It's he makes people uncomfortable by not taking it. And then there's people who don't like him anyway. And they merge together in this incredible typhoon of bullshit. Just a mm -hmm. bullshit typhoon. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a boomer misconception or a popular misconception that you phrase better is that everyone has a LeBron James in them and they can summon it if they just work hard enough, which is deeply, deeply misleading. I think it's more true that maybe the generation after the millennials have figured this out truly and millennials were knocking on the door of this which is I am comfortable with who I am and I don't care what you think and I think that's a really logical progression of the way we've been thinking about identity so when Ben Simmons shows up and says oh I'm the best and I'm a max player I'm not comfortable shooting threes though but I'll do everything else we say where's the LeBron James in you that you can summon I mean people accuse LeBron James of that with Michael Jordan and it's just like a traditional thing like why can't you work harder and be more like Michael Jordan and LeBron James is like I am better than him though <laughs> I just can't do the things that you see him do but he doesn't protect the rim like I do etc whatever and Ben Simmons it's almost like the psychology of a fan which I have in spades which is if I were him so if yes, I, if I were him, I would take that 12 foot jumper. Yes. I'm not afraid to take that when I'm over at the rec league. That's my shot. Yeah. And if you put me in his body, I am that Lebr LeBron James component where I'm going to take everything he does well already and then be brave and do the things that I would do in that situation, which is the joy of being a fan and like the joke of being a fan. Right. Yes. And and it's this conflation of what is literally a physical limitation. He does not have good hand-eye coordination to shoot a basketball from long distance and turning it into a question of virtue. And it also ties into the Sixers fans' lionization of, of, of Joel Embiid, who is the best player on the team and is a top five player in the NBA, but is also sort of the Virgin Mary saint to like the corrupted Ben Simmons. He's the man of the people who works on his game and can never be blamed for anything while the failures of the Sixers always fall on the flawed Ben Simmons and his errors and his limitations are, are those of character and those of heart and those of wanting to win because Embiid can never be questioned in those ways. Right. And when Embiid admits that he was maybe a little overweight and he ran out of gas at the end of last season, which he didn't, but he admitted that maybe he got a little winded and he wasn't in the best shape possible. And Ben Simmons is like, I did my thing, whatever. <laughs> we were there. It, 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 it's almost as if we've just decided to 
uh, we always do this. We just decide to align with certain things. And Embiid will say things like, oh, I lost weight just through sheer will. We're like, isn't he the best? And when, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, that makes no sense. And if Ben Simmons said that, we'd be all over him. And this is just how the way the world works. But Joel Embiid said he grew to be seven foot two. And everyone's like, he's seven foot two. I said he was seven foot two. You said he's seven foot two. Then they released the measurements and he's like six foot 11 and a half. Right, right. And, yeah, and Ben Simmons is taller than Al Horford, right? He's like a if quarter ben of an Simmons, inch taller. If it came out that Ben Simmons was actually six foot eight, people would have gone nuts. They would have started roasting him. Yeah. But, so but deceptive. The, but the one thing that I wanted to point out, though, is why this is really about feelings and not basketball, is that there are no basketball reasons to question the effectiveness of Ben Simmons, the effectiveness of Ben Simmons alongside Joel Embiid, the effectiveness of Ben Simmons with Joe and the rest of the roster. Because if you look at the numbers, it's just fiction. Mm -hmm. So it's all feelings. There's nothing that's about basketball. It's feelings about spacing. It's feelings about what you're seeing. It's feelings about a couple games in the playoffs when Embiid played poorly and Simmons looked tentative. They're, it's just feelings. What's wild is the Sixers starting lineup last season had an offensive rating of 122 points per 100 possessions. For some comparative analysis here, the Rockets set an NBA record two seasons ago with an offensive rating of 114. Their starting lineup had an offensive rating of 125. So the Sixers starting lineup, despite the fact that they only played together after the trade deadline, was almost as good as the starting lineup on the best offense in NBA history. And yet we're talking about, oh, I don't know how they pair. Do they fit together? Oh, the paint's cramped. It's just bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. The Sixers had one of the best offenses in NBA history. Against the Raptors, they had an offensive rating with the starting lineup of 108. The Raptors were like 107. The Sixers outscored the Raptors by seven points per hundred possessions when their starters were on the court. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying the numbers do not add up to any of these arguments about the fit or his three ball having a negative impact on the Sixers. It's just a lie. It's a straight up lie. And when you're looking for it, I think we can see it over and over with people who talk to you about sports at the bar and the criticism with Simmons and dishonest defenses always comes down to a, a version of filibustering where I try to find out with a point of view that isn't number based like the numbers that you just produced which you know I, I believe in defensive rating and how those things are calculated and it's just like starting to name players and matchups and series and just spitting out a lot of names and information where I'm like, none of this is true. It just sounds like it's true. And when you see Ben Simmons play a game with their eyeballs and when you see these stats that we kind of trust collectively, it doesn't prove that he's a liability at all. He's actually one of a part of one of the best teams we've seen in recent NBA history. There's also just this escalationism going on where it's like, I don't like him because he wanted to play for the Lakers instead of here. And then it's like, I didn't like him, but also the fact that he won't take a 17-footer, that annoys me. So those things are now tied together. Then the Sixers lose in the playoffs, and you're disappointed, so you blame him. Then you say, you know what's standing between the Sixers and, and winning a title? <laughs> it's Ben Simmons' shooting ability. That's the that's the thing that if that could be switched, then we could win a title. But until he does that, that's why we won't win. Yeah. And it's taking starting out with the fact that you just were irritated because he kind of wanted to go to the Lakers like any rational person would in the draft mm -hmm. because you'd rather go to a bigger market and make more money. And turning that several years later into this guy is the reason that we won't win a championship. It's just some really twisted shit, man. It, and, it, it's, it's, it's dark. Yeah. And there's certain human beings that have a lot of gravity and certain NBA players that have tons of gravity. And Ben Simmons is one of those guys. And he, he was framed as a villain really early on when he was 
before he even committed to college, he was framed as a villain because of all the reasons you've mentioned before. And he never stood a chance. And uh, a player like Zion is never going to have the attention that Ben Simmons has because we've put him into a different box. Um, But they essentially kind of are the same talents coming out of college. Ben Simmons was a unanimous number one even more so than Zion Williamson because he had more aspects to his game that were useful and modern. Um, and he's, he's come true. He's, he's, he's come through on his promise. And look, I do not think Ben Simmons is particularly likable. I enjoy the fact that he's a villain. I think that's entertaining, but I understand why people don't like him, but you compare him to say Giannis, who is a lovable, charming character who was introduced to smoothies and is from the other side of the earth and came here and he's just so charming and innocent and we've seen him grow into this amazing player and it's like, well, they play the same. Mm -hmm. You know, Giannis is better because he's better at scoring the paint right now, but Giannis can't shoot. they're, They're the same player. They're guarded the same way. There's no particular difference. And that's not to say Simmons is as good as Giannis, but the flaws are the same. And again, Draymond Green, there are, there are a lot of guys, or at least a collection of guys, who are very similar dudes. And there's only one of them that faces this bizarre mockery, even from his own fans. It's, 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 a, it's a strange situation. Yeah, and it becomes tribal at some point. At some point, we're not even talking about Ben Simmons anymore. We're talking about arguing, and that's kind of the point where I check out. It's just different debate tactics about something that we stopped talking about a while ago. Um, Because like you said, there's examples of players like Ben Simmons that have existed and thrived in the NBA to an elite level, like an MVP level. I mean, literally the current MVP (laughs) and the guy who is probably going to win MVP or rookie of the year this next season. And Russell Westbrook can't shoot for shit. Mm -hmm. And he won the MVP two seasons ago, three seasons ago. Yeah. We're, we're talking. You... All right. Like, I'm sorry. Let me just keep going. Uh, the defensive player of the year and a top 20 player, uh, Rudy Gobert, he can't shoot. Um, Draymond Green, probably still a top 20 player, defensive player of the year in the past. He can't shoot. We've, we've just picked up four or five players who are arguably in the league's top 20. For sure. RJ can't, Barrett. Who can't, who can't shoot. Yeah. RJ <laughs> Barrett probably going to win rookie of the year. Top 15 <laughs> player. Can't shoot. Taj Gibson. <laughs> Although top, Mitch, yeah. top 20 player. Can't shoot. The, the joking ends with Mitchell Robinson, who I actually think is a top 20 player. And can he shoot? No. But that's what I mean. There, There's like 20% of the elite players in the NBA can't shoot at all. Or at least don't shoot to a degree that makes anyone guard them from there, let alone could you put them on one, you know, put them 20 feet away from the ball and have someone pay attention to them. It just doesn't exist. 20 percent of the stars. Anyway, yeah. we're reaching. It's the it's the Zion talk though. We're we're moving into a new era in the NBA, and I feel like, I feel like Cookies has been on 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 top of this. We've talked for two seasons about the declining importance of unitaskers, that guys who can only shoot and are unable to do anything else are far less valuable than they were even five years ago, maybe even three years ago. Having a dude who can just stand in one place and hit threes, but can't defend, can't dribble, can't pass, can't rebound, those guys are basically being exercised from the NBA. And good teams don't play them. Yeah. So and he, mm-hmm. oh, the, go, the, go the natural consequence of everyone being able to shoot not only pushes those guys to the periphery, but it makes guys like Simmons and Giannis and Zion more important and much more playable and much more effective because they don't have to shoot the ball because everyone else can. Yeah, and the interns have picked up on this. Like They have been talking... God of, bless them. <laughs> they've been talking about the movement towards bigs for a solid two years because a lot of... And a lot of it's personnel, but a lot of these bigger guys can do a lot more than just stand on the at the arc and shoot threes. They can pass. They can create looks. They could... Uh, stand in the dunk spot they can finish they can protect the the rim all these and some of them can even move out like Mitchell Robinson can somehow protect the arc as well as the rim in one possession which is just extraordinary but um, you're right and we have never 
it's not like we had sided with Ben Simmons just because we enjoy villainy. There is just proof that there's nothing to see there. You just draft Ben Simmons and pay him all the money and surround him with players that work. You know, for all the concern that people have about spacing when they discuss Ben Simmons, I didn't hear a lot of griping when Mike Muscala was traded for Boban. Moose. You know, if, 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 if they are lifelong floor spacing fan men, then that should have been something that immediately, immediately got their attention. That the Sixers didn't have a stretch five. That yep. yeah, they let Luke gonna, Cornett go go the, untouched. The God, Luke Cornett. That <laughs> Philly was going to try to play TJ and Simmons, but did not have a stretch five to put on the floor with those kind of players. I did not see a red flag go up. There was no floor spacing banner that unfurled. <laughs> the no horn that that blared. They didn't no, let the no red flag siren. fly. <laughs> I didn't hear. I didn't hear any of that stuff. True. I didn't hear any of it. It just seems to be that spacing is this all-consuming emphasis when you talk about him. Well, it's an but, yeah. It's oh, sorry. A, go, go ahead. Back to the point. It's an argue. It's an argument and debate about uh, the kind of fan and the kind of philosophy your fandom has, and that's all it is. We stopped talking about Ben Simmons so long ago. Exactly. Exactly. And and that's why I'm very very excited about this new generation of players that's going to come into the league that understands that when the floor is spaced out properly because it's easy to get shooting at every position you can now start taking guys with elite skill sets that can't be cramped by a defense that parks in the paint and I think that's what's really really fun Mm -hmm. you know if if you took Michael Jordan and you put him in the league the second best player the third best player of all time at least (laughs) <laughs> at least the third best, maybe fourth. Hmm. But if you put Jordan into the league a few years ago when no bigs could shoot and the paint was a thicket of defenders, Jordan would have really struggled to do the kind of stuff that he did. But if you put him into the league today when you have a, look, a team like Toronto, which had stretch bigs such as Mark Gasol or Serge Ibaka and the floor was wide open, all of a sudden, a guy like Michael Jordan would then go back to being Michael Jordan because he's unguardable one-on-one. And I feel like that's what's really cool about the NBA is you can start we, we, can, we can start a new baseline, which is everyone can shoot pretty much. You can always find a shooter. You can always get spacing if you put the right guys out there and, and you, it's the right combination. But now you don't have to. And I think that's what's so fun about these guys we've been describing. I'm really excited for Zion to be on a court where there's spacing everywhere and teams have to figure out how do you stop Zion from getting to the basket and dunking on your head with one defender. Yeah, you're exactly like Ben Simmons this year. You're 100% correct. And you're one for one. 12 12 of 13, baby. (laughs) But like... I, I. I think we're watching the evolution play out. And I think this wave of new young players is a new wave. And unfortunately, we all get old and we're watching the Westbrooks and Paul Georges and Kawhis kind of like, you know, give it one last go. And all these young guys are playing a different, we're looking at a different game. And uh, to exactly what you said, uh, it's the type of things these young players can do, this personnel um, and their philosophy, and we're finally seeing like step four, five, six of the of the hinky thing or the analytics thing. Like in baseball, I think it really shifted. No Simbin, it really shifted recently, where we're looking at a whole different product. And also, shout out to Sam Hinky, who envisioned all of this. The Sixers are a beast, and this is all his doing. We can't say that enough. It's true. It's true. It, and. Even the cap space that they have was because he was judicious in using it. But speaking of this, moving away from the Sixers for a second, you mentioned Mitchell Robinson. I know, I know. Oh, my God. But again, to our our listeners, that was a lot about Ben Simmons, but a lot of it was about ideas and how we view the game and how we think about it going forward and what our perceptions are and our feelings and how they sometimes run counter are you, are to what's you actually happening on the court. Putting on the white makeup, turning off the lights, and lighting some randals? I'm, in, I'm alone. 
mm. in my <laughs> dirty ass room and I'm staring at Randall's. So the Knicks, <laughs> at least in the preseason, the goth team of the NBA, which... Oh, they're not in the NBA. I, I misspoke. <laughs> A goth team that used to be in the NBA. That's right. And was relegated several years ago and now gloriously and yeah now it dwells in a in an eerie <laughs> dark netherworld in which they are neither dead nor alive a, a, a one of dante's rings of the inferno where they just stare at randall's yeah dancing under highways synchronized <laughs> <laughs> those beautiful beautiful dances you know they did it all for the nookie <laughs> so they can but, get the <laughs> Number one podcast in America. (laughs) (laughs) The perfect plot. But so so the Knicks in their preseason games here are looking like they're going to start Elfried Payton and they're going to start one of the Morais, whichever one is on the Knicks. We'll never know. Along with Mitchell Robinson, um, uh, your boy, R.J. Barrett. Top 20. And... One other, who's the other starter? Is that it? That's it. Yeah. So my question here is, what's the what's the idea of starting Alfred and Morris? Why? Why would you do that? Do they just want to drive their new car around the block for a second? I'm skeptical that more uh, the Morai is gonna have the usage that he expects. I think he thinks he's gonna make some solid money after this run in New York, playing on a bad team, being the leader, taking the shots, being that guy who just takes no gruff from any opponent. Um, But I don't understand the logic of starting these guys unless Dolan just wants to see his money on the court. I'm trying to understand what the Knicks plan is here. Think Jesus. Always start with Jesus. Okay. Okay. No disrespect. So it begins with the good book. With losses. Yes. Well, uh, like Ge- Genesis. <laughs> well, if the Knicks as an entity are the chosen ones and they are standing alone aside from the NBA, then their mistakes don't matter because they're doing things with virtue, right? So starting well, a more... Ni- well, I, hmm. I don't know. The Knicks, if we're starting with Genesis... Mm. Phil Collins. The Knicks, the Knicks are not enough into analytics to say that we're in numbers yet. No, so no, gonna, they don't care I'm, about numbers. Uh, right, so they're not in numbers. I'm just trying to think where in the Pentateuch mm. they fall. Are they more of a Deuteronomy? <laughs> I mean, oh, Exodus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm glad we got that sorted. Woo, perfect pod. <laughs> and we're out. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, what are they doing? Right off the bat, you're just like, this is what we feared, and this is all of our fears coming true. This is the let, locust. Let me ask you this. What? The lost tribe <laughs> in the wilderness, mm. marching for days on end, yeah. waiting for that red sea to part. Do you see a glimmer of hope? Can you do it? And I know you don't because you're rational and you're goth. <laughs> but what? I guess, I guess let me rephrase that. What are Knicks fans optimistic about? Because when I put up a couple tweets that were critical of their offseason, people were mad. They accused me of being the liberal bias or whatever of the Knicks. Like, oh, the Knicks, uh, the media is always going after the Knicks, man. You're like, well, (laughs) what what part did you want me to, you know, praise you for? Which, where's the, what's the media doing wrong? You know, the Knicks won 17 games and, and signed... Taj Gibson, they struck out on big free agents. They traded Porzingis, who looks like a robot of death. Now, what what exactly is the media getting wrong? <laughs> well, can, can, Nick- I, can, can you answer that question? <laughs> what is the media getting wrong about the Knicks? Well, Knicks, the Knicks fan base kind of fragments into people who are always optimistic, but actually like to fight more than thinking about the team. Um, the, the naysayers who are just like, oh, my God, they're terrible. They're the worst. And the enlightened like us who are like, they're just wearing that <laughs> King Diamond makeup. <laughs> they're just shopping for records like. Uh, they're sleeping in a coffin. Like, what do you want? They're doing their own thing, man. They're tuning their Ibanez guitars and grilling up a storm. They have black roses all over their homes. Like, it's a, just a it's 
it just hits different. <laughs> right. So, right. So, I mean, on, on social media, I get accused of being uh, a Knicks hater, which is so weird. And like, because I, I apologize for Dolan and I kind of like these young guys. The optimism is RJ Barrett looks like he's going to be a pro for a while. And I think he's going to be a good bench player eventually on a good team, not in New York. But he looks like he doesn't suck. And I am very grateful for that. I don't know if he's going to be very good, but he's going to get his run in the NBA for the next 10 years. And Mitchell Robinson is a is a shooting star. If he can stay healthy, he might be one of the most fun players in all the league. But Or, or stay on the court because he definitely has a penchant for committing silly fouls. But he was a really young, raw player. Mm-hmm. I, I and, think Mitchell yeah. Robinson does have a chance to be a star. And if you did a redraft, I would probably take him over DeAndre Ayton, you know, in the, the top five. I think it would be a tough call, and you'd mm-hmm. have to really evaluate if you think that Mitchell Robinson can stay on the court. But in terms of his impact, I kind of think he's a better center prospect than Ayton. And Ayton had, from what we can tell, has made improvements. I mean, we don't know yet, but he looks like he's committed without a Mamba mentality, I hope to like working on his flaws and uh, a lot of his instincts off the pick and roll are bad a lot of his defensive instincts remind us of Amari Stoudemire where it's all there you can jump higher and faster than anybody but you're just jumping in the wrong direction Um, but Mitchell Robinson changes the complexion of an, an entire defense and he makes offenses kind of shift their point of view on the fly and I think that's a really rare kind of player who can defend the rim and the arc in two seconds and He's just a dominant guy on one end of the court who has an insane efficiency on the other end of the court. I'll take it. Um, but the Knicks- look, we, look, we know that the most valuable offensive player in the modern NBA is a scorer distributor. Mm-hmm. And that's why guys like, say, Draymond are so incredibly valuable because they give you distribution skills from like a defensive player at a position where you don't normally get it. Yeah. And that's why James Harden is the best offensive player in history because he gives you incredible efficiency, but also he creates all these shots and defensively. We know it's a center. It's the rim protector. That is the most important defensive position in the NBA. The same way offensively, it's your score distributor and we see what happens with Gobert and Embiid when they're on the court versus when they're not. And it changes the entire complexion of a team's defense that enables you to get away with so many mistakes, to get beaten, to have mismatches, and you just have this equalizer waiting there to snuff people out. Mm-hmm. And and Gobert is kind of the most limited of all three, and yet he has some of the biggest impact of any active player in the league. And I only say that because he's he's a bit slower. He doesn't he's a very efficient offensively, but he's not as active offensively as even Mitchell Robinson is. But it's I, I think this goes back to a little bit of our Ben Simmons conversation where people are just accepting the idea of small ball now. And now we're providing them with all these players that are the opposite of small ball and who are just or even more effective than playing I mean, when we talk small ball, we're just talking about Draymond Green, to be honest. We're just talking about uh, the Warriors. We're just, we're just talking about untraditional centers, really. Yeah. Yeah, and like the most successful example would be the lineup of death. And that's what we mean, because a lot of teams have tried it, and it hasn't worked as well. Obviously. Well, it, well it's yeah. skill ball. Yes, and, yes. And that's why positional arguments are, in, are, are, is, are kind of <laughs> irrelevant Sorry. in the way that like yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. if – you're getting distribution from a forward or you're getting it from a guard. Like, that doesn't matter. But there are certain things you have to do as a team in order to win. Like, you have to be able to rebound. You have to be able to protect the rim. You have to have shooting from someone. You have to have some distribution and passing and ball handling. And it doesn't matter where you get those things from. You just have to have them. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is a total callback to uh, DeAndre Ayton. Is he just Kevin Willis? Who was pretty good. Come on. No disrespect to Kevin Willis. It's pretty good. Is he Keith Van Horn? That might be the perfect comparison. (laughs) I mean, I know what you're saying, and I was down on Aiton, but I'm not that down on Aiton. I still think he goes in the top six or seven of that draft. 
and that's very high still. Um, I'm I'm not down on Aiton either. I'm yeah, just wondering like if he's one of those guys who you might be able to pencil in for twenty and ten for mm-hmm. the next I don't know decade, but he won't necessarily win you a lot more games yeah. because the twenty ten he's giving you aren't necessarily attached to elite rim protection or causing double teams that allow him to pass and, and get easy shots for teammates or him being a great passer who mm-hmm. can turn some of those possessions into more than just ISO scores. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. He's got a, he, he's super young. Yeah. But, and he was an eye test pick where uh, he looked like Dwight Howard, which he'll never be like Dwight Howard was kind of his prototype, but, excellent and an instant hall of famer and one of the best players we've ever seen at that position Eaton, right he's closer to having a super long career in the nba and dropping these numbers but the the kind of and we're seeing all these new articles come out about um, not only efficiency but impact of scoring to wins and the value of what kind of points you do score and he doesn't even hit those bars that even maybe a Mitchell Robinson might where uh, he doesn't have the volume of actions on the court as DeAndre Ayton but they're kind of more impactful and more efficient in that way and we're finally figuring out how to talk about that through numbers um, and through player tracking and I think we're looking at the next wave of evaluating these players but to your point DeAndre Ayton's going to be good and he's going to help a team but He's going to also be a max player, so you have to evaluate him on cost and effectiveness. I have a general theory that I guess you can apply to anything. is not particularly insightful, but that basketball players should just do what they're good at and try to avoid doing things that they're bad at. Hmm. That, is, that is not a particularly insightful idea, but it kind of brings up what you were just discussing, and that is Boogie Cousins at his best, better than Tyson Chandler at his best. And I don't know. I don't know which one is more conducive to winning games. Is having a defensive player of the year who only scores 10 or 12 points a game, but on incredible efficiency and catches lobs, is that better than having an offensive fulcrum who's an okay defender and you know chews up all your possessions, can have 40-point games, pretty good at passing, does all this kind of stuff. I don't know which is better. I, you know, certainly one of them is paid more. One of them is the superstar, where the other one is not. But it's kind of like, is Robert Covington better than DeMar DeRozan? I don't know. You know, is an elite defender, 3 and D guy, more valuable or less valuable than a guy who can score 20 points a game on, like, mediocre efficiency? I, 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 that's, that's like how you balance building a team in the NBA. Yeah, and I always think of the grit and grind Grizzlies who had that incredible defense with Tony Allen. And I think Zebo was even on that team. Um, and and they made it as far in the playoffs as their defense could carry them. And I don't know if we've... Uh, I'm trying to think of the weakest defensive team that's ever won it all. And it usually ends up being a team that has both. Um, to get to the top. That, and, that Cavaliers team with LeBron was not a good defensive team. But they beat the Heat, right? Oh No, I'm talking about the one that beat the Warriors. Oh, okay. They ended I mean, up that was incredible. playing better, and it was an incredible yeah. series. But that was not a strong defensive team over yeah, the that course might of be the season. Uh, Knicks legend Timofey Mozgov. I mean, I'm sure there were other ones, but that's the one that just kind of jumps yeah. up. I mean, I don't remember the, if the mm-hmm. Dallas Mavericks... And, or an incredible yeah. defensive team when they yeah. beat the uh, LeBron's Heatles. Yeah, yeah true. Uh, I, I want to go back to your point about doing what you do well. And we talked about that with Simmons. And Simmons does many things. But uh, this goes back to our discussion between like the, the Gladwell camp of 10,000 hours or the Epstein camp of range. Right. By the way, I, I retract that. The Mavericks had, a eight, had the eighth ranked defense that season. So they were, they were a good defensive team. I mean, sorry, sorry. Tyson Chandler, I think it should be a Hall of Famer. Um, but that's a longevity question. But he was one of the most impactful defenders for a good chunk of a decade, 
I, I'm a really big fan and, of his. And they, even the Cavs that season, they fell off, but they had a top 10 defense. So oh, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's a, a deeper uh, dive someone could take to find the worst defensive champion of all time. And it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to look bad. You know, right. it's going to be a team with good defense. But I will, I will say, I uh, unfairly maligned that Cavs team and the uh, Mavs. They were totally fine, upper third of the NBA mm-hmm. defensive teams. I apologize mm-hmm. profusely. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, Quo. I, I, <laughs> I'm apologizing to everyone here for like, all of my bits. <laughs> all the bits. Um, Every bit of it. Yeah. But, you know, back to – and this is all framed around our discussion with the Knicks where they have one of these guys. And that's more than we can have – I mean, I was a very big Porzingis fan, and I hope he does really, really well. But he had issues like on-the-court issues that – and concerning health that were really concerning and we were looking at a huge payday. I don't think Mitchell Robinson ever gets a max deal, but Porzingis was lined up for the deal that Cuban gave him. And the optimism with, with the Knicks comes in that you have R.J. Barrett who looks the part, and you know I kind of am skeptical of that, but he looks like the player we wanted for years, which is just this small forward shooting guard type who moves like Ray Allen a little bit that came from Duke like we wanted that as a fan base and Mitchell Robinson pleases the nerds and and we have something that's that defies history and I always think about the the NBA and teams in terms of like we have to let go of the way we think history operates because every team is different and we can't just say the Knicks are going to lose forever because they've lost before every team brings a different set of variables and it's just that the Knicks variable the predominant one is Steve Mills and James Dolan so every year they're probably putting together a team that isn't good but the Knicks were a few small small changes of like the butterfly flapping its wings away from being a really scary team and instead we are just not the worst team but a very bad team I just started thinking about Porzingis who I believe should play center for the most part but you can certainly put him at the four Mm -hmm. and I think you'd have to um, adjust your lineup a bit and and but I, I again having RJ Barrett who seems to be a good prospect who's looked fairly good so far as a guy who can pass and, and score hmm. with Porzingis and Mitchell Robinson. Oh man. All of a sudden You're I'm like, wait a minute. Heart, All of a sudden I'm like, wait, 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 what just happened? Yeah. They could have had Mitchell Robinson and Porzingis as your four five and made sure that one of them is at the five the yeah. entire game. Like, are you kidding me? Right. With and one j- or two good free agents that that team's that team's good yeah. and young. Like what and the I- fuck, man? If they had signed Brogdon and had like Brogdon mm-hmm. And um, Mitchell, um, Mitchell Robinson, Porzingis, and uh, and RJ uh, Barrett, RJ Barrett, along with a a whole bunch Smokes. more money. Yeah, like like that team actually would have been like really interesting. And I want to clarify, like I wanted to, I wanted to trade Porzingis for picks. So when they traded him for cap space, I was kind of annoyed because at that point, when as soon as he got hurt, I thought they should just max him out, uh, let him rest, and just sign him because his value would be so low that it wasn't worth letting go of his upside which is very very high even though he's bow-legged and when they traded him for space I was like I know what you're doing and this could reap rewards but that's kind of disappointing I would rather you just sign him because there's no guarantee and as soon as Kevin Durant's Achilles went there was a disaster it was a disaster so I think they gambled and they lost they took an L on the Porzingis deal well, one thing that I would have liked about the Porzingis Robinson front court is that you could play them together because Porzingis is such a good outside shooter. But on those nights when Mitchell Robinson racks up like six fouls in fourteen minutes, that's going to happen. As he did a, lot. a couple times, yeah. Then you you have someone to play the five for the rest of the game. Yeah, I mean Mitchell Robinson wanting it more shouldn't hurt you that much. I agree. You're punishing him. <laughs> For just wanting to block shots. Yeah. I mean, why but, doesn't everyone foul out in 14 minutes? Um, I agree with that. 
but like I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of these guys who who are like Mitchell Rob I mean I'm, excuse me, I misspoke. There are a lot of guys who can change the dynamics of a team that are used wrong. And I think one of those guys that may be the case, may be the case, is, is Markel Fultz. Mm. And when he was in Philly, he was put in lineups with guys like Ben Simmons and TJ McConnell, who can't shoot. So now I'm seeing him in Orlando, and maybe they can do a better job with a guy who can't shoot. And they can figure out ways to put him into a lineup that makes sense. And we're seeing some clips of Fultz now with the Magic. And he looks okay, I guess. Have you, yeah. have you watched any of these? I have. He looks okay. I mean, he shows flashes of what we loved about him in Washington. He still looks, I mean, it might be just bias coming into it, but he doesn't look like a potential superstar at this point. He looks like somebody who's in that DJ Augustine world, that Jared Jack world, just somebody who could, I mean, he's going to be a better defender than all of them because of his size, but he reminds me of someone true to my heart, which is, Frank Nilakina, and they've come from very different origins and paths, but they're kind of at the same place, right? Like they're both trying to prove that they belong in the league and their ceilings are relatively low, but those ceilings are very useful, which is defense and some distribution. Yeah, I, I think you phrased that better than I did. I, I was kind of trying to clumsily get to that, to saying like, it goes back to the idea of, do what you can do and try to do a good job at those things. And when Fultz was on Philly, that team's just absurd lack of interest in shooters and guards put Fultz in a position where the few skills that he can do, that he has on an NBA level, were not particularly rewarded. Mm. And the ones that he can't do, which is spot up and shoot, were emphasized. And he looked really bad. And I'm wondering if the skills that he can do, which are essentially being on the ball, dribbling, getting into the paint, shooting crappy little fadeaways, not getting to the foul line, not really taking threes, playing some defense. Defending on ball, yeah. Right, those things can be useful. And it kind of makes me wish that Philly hadn't been so strange about their roster construction that we could have seen if he can do those things at a level that could have been helpful. Because, God, like, if you put uh, him on this Philly team now, that's so interesting. Right? And that that's what's an annoying to me, is that there was this thing of, he can't shoot, he can't shoot, he can't shoot. Well, there are, again, as we discussed all this episode, there are a lot of guys in the NBA who are useful players who can't shoot. And I don't know if Fultz is one of them. But I don't know if he isn't one of them either. And... If he can get his jumper back, then, of course, that changes the dynamics. But there are guys like Westbrook or DeRozan or Ish Smith or even like Tony Roten or MCW. There, There is no lack of young guys with poor jumpers. Someone like De'Aaron Fox shot, you know, 31% from three as a rookie and then improved a lot. Well, yeah, we, we laud Rajon Rondo but forget about his weaknesses. Yeah, so there's a weird thing about Fultz, though, is that his lack of an outside shot should not necessarily have prevented him from being a good player. And I'm trying to figure out which of these moving parts is causing the friction. Is it that his lack of a jumper had a trickle-down effect, which made him lose confidence in other parts of his game, changed the way that he's defended, and made, say, turnaround jumpers and spin moves become more or less his entire bread and butter or is this shooting issue camouflaging the fact that he doesn't have a strong skill set or was it being in Philly with teams that did not have other ball handlers did not have many shooters was that why he wasn't able to successfully contribute so I don't know I'm, I'm I think Fultz is a really good example of this kind of player who's only put up 680 career minutes. Like We just don't know what he is, except that he's always kind of been flawed in the same way. You know what I think about when I think about Fultz is we won't know all the, the legit questions that you just asked 
until we figure out what's happening off the court. And what I think about is when they realized poor kids weren't bad at school, they just couldn't see the chalkboard and they weren't sleeping enough because their parents were arguing or drinking. And it was that fatigue and not having kids admit that they needed glasses were, were driving down test scores. And it, it took years for people to figure this out. And it was such a simple reason that it kind of went unnoticed. And with Fultz, I constantly I'm trying to figure that out. What is the simple thing that we're not noticing with him? Is it, you know, we've heard publicly that his stepfather is a big part of his life and maybe influencing the way he thinks about the game. And we've seen examples like the, the Ball family where the way they live their lives kind of shows up on the court in certain ways. And with Fultz, I don't think we can answer those questions that you ask, and we, we have to do that soon before he's out of the league, until we get to the bottom. If Does he need glasses? How, you know, like figuratively? Yeah, is, is Fultz a good player or a potential superstar who has been waylaid by this shooting issue? Or is he a mediocre guy who didn't deserve to go number one, who is not equipped to be a star NBA player who is hiding behind a shoulder issue. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone has any idea. No. And he was a bona fide number one. When the Sixers traded up to get him, it was dumb because they could have had any of those four guys. But we understood why they did that. And the, the however dumb that move was, at least they got the number one guy that was consensus from everybody to be a sure thing. And he there was, was nothing not wrong with thing. yeah. There was yeah. nothing wrong with drafting him, as you said. He was the consensus number one pick, but that doesn't mean much, mm -hmm. you know, in the grand scheme of things. Because so were a lot of other guys who didn't become star NBA players. Yeah, yeah he's not in that um, Zion build or Ben Simmons build. He's in the Aiton build, where if he didn't go number one, we'd be like, oh, that's surprising, but not that shocked. If Ben Simmons didn't go number one, we'd be shocked. Well, if, if Philly hadn't traded up, Boston would have taken Tatum. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't going to take Fultz. Yeah. So this whole conversation about him being a number one pick, it wouldn't have mattered. He would have gone second or third. Right. And he'd be filed away in the sort of Jaleel Okafor category or Marvin Williams, guys who went high and didn't live up to their billing. Yeah, Deion Waiters. But when you combine the mysteriousness of, of the fault situation with the fact that he went number one, you know, that's when it becomes the, uh, you know, that, that perfect storm that you're talking about. No Simbin, when A-Rod signed the biggest contract in the major league baseball in that era, we all criticized him heavily for it for many reasons, because we didn't like him all these Ben Simmons reasons. And then quietly, Derek Jeter signed a contract for just a little less, but no one talks about him. And now he's considered like the greatest teammate and the greatest citizen Major League Baseball has ever produced. And that's the kind of gravity that you accept when you're a number one overall pick. You will always be criticized. Like, I don't know what it feels like to be Kwame Brown or Michael Oluwa Candy, but it can't be easy. Like, shout out to Greg Oden, man. That's, well, that was unfair. Yes, yes. And it's not that, that you accept it. It's that it's thrust upon you. True, true. And no one talks about like Hashim Thabit when they bring up notorious busts because he went number two. Mm -hmm. He was a bigger bust than Michael Olamikandi, like far bigger. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't get brought up the same way. Mm -hmm. He was a bigger bust, arguably, than Anthony Bennett. Woo. Wow. I mean, we're talking about some busts here. Wow. But I, Anthony, I you know, Anthony Bennett gets, gets brought up quite a bit, although he is just so forgotten in a way, too. I know. It's, I was so angry at the Cavs for a second, and I just forgot about that whole thing. I mean, the Cavs had that stretch where they took Tristan Thompson, Anthony Dion Bennett, Waiters. Dion Waiters, and then they got Kyrie. But yeah. they were feasting at the top of that, that, that lottery there for a while and really only came away with one good player. He, they were the, the reason why we were all doing hypothetical lottery reform <laughs> um, exercises because they kept on getting these top picks and 
like squandering them and we're like we can't afford we can't afford as a league to let these dumb teams profit with these picks and, and if just, LeBron hadn't wanted to come back they probably would have take I mean they did take Wiggins yeah and then they <laughs> traded him they would have had Wiggins <laughs> Yeah, this is a murderer's row. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, look, Kyrie is a basketball genius in certain ways, uh, but the rest of that, the rest good. of that is a wild group. Oh my god, that is just horrifying. That is some Halloween shit. Um, shout out to Wiggins, who is uh, turns out to be immovable, even though the the Timberwolves finally identified that they might have to trade him in order. to It's be so him. great. They're like, okay, 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 <laughs> we'll finally acknowledge it. It's time to move Andrew Wiggins. And everyone's like, whew, uh, what? <laughs> it's it's amazing how many teams would have taken him if they did this two years ago. Like oh, before he got that extension, if you tried to dump him that summer. Usual the, suspects, the, yeah. Knicks would have been all over him. Sixers probably would have been at that point. Jordan and the, the Hornets probably would have taken a look. Um, yeah, all the usual suspects would have inquired. But... They are now stuck with Wiggins for, I mean, he's never going to opt out of his contract. No, why would you? And is he going to ruin Carl Anthony Towns' career, who is turning into one of the most unsung best players in history? Like, he's one of the top players we've ever seen. Talk about a number one overall pick. And we don't talk about him because he's squandered with Wiggins in Minnesota. Can I bring up a different subject that ties in very closely to Carl Anthony Towns here? Go off, kid. He, he's involved. Go off. So I've been thinking quite a bit about how we judge what players do on the court in terms of how a possession ends up. And I, that's a little abstract, but it's not abstract. Is that when James Harden has the ball, he can score, he can get to the line, he can create a shot for a teammate. And then there are the negatives. He could turn the ball over, he could miss a shot, he could pass the ball to someone who misses a shot, Right. So there, there, there's various outcomes. In this idea of positionless basketball, I think it's strange that when someone like Carl Anthony Towns gets the ball in the paint, we don't demand that a big guy give us the same number of outcomes as a guard. I think that's strange. It's the same possession. doesn't matter who gets it. But when Carl Anthony gets the ball... We expect that he can score, he can get to the line, he'll miss a shot, he'll turn the ball over, but him creating a shot for a teammate is not really demanded. We don't look at him and say, hey, Towns, you have more turnovers than assists. That's bullshit, and that's hurting our team Hmm. because he's a big guy. If you had a guard who averaged 27 points a game like Joel Embiid does and averaged three and a half assists and four turnovers, we call them like a Carmelo Anthony, like ISO monster. Hmm. Why do we view big guys as being unresponsible for being distributors? I think two reasons. One reason on the court, and I don't know, you you pose a good question, and I'm just working, workshopping through this. <laughs> um I think on the court is because by the time the big man has the ball, they're so close to a valuable shot that you're not asking them to create another equally valuable shot. Uh, So when Carl Anthony Towns has the ball in the paint, him being a distributor at that point is unnecessary because you've already manufactured the value. Um, By passing out, you take away all that work. The the vibe. Like, yeah. Let me just Go say, ahead. I like that. I like that idea. I would say that with the rise of the three pointer, it's probably less valid, in that a post possession is worth less, generally speaking, mm-hmm. than a different kind of attempt. But, but I do think there is validity to that. If you get the ball to a good score that's close to the basket, it just sort of aesthetically is like a fine place for a possession to end. Mm-hmm. And and in Towns's case, you're looking at a. Andrew Wiggins buzzing around you waiting for that outlet. <laughs> and you just decide to go for Feed a turtle. Wiggins. Yeah. Feed Wiggins. <laughs> he's he's going to get hot. <laughs> How can the he get Luke, hot? <laughs> feed the lukewarm hand. Keep the defenses honest, Towns. <laughs> the chilly, cold hand of Wiggins awaits <laughs> like <Yeah>. death. <laughs> you can't build a fire without 
Tinder, Ben. You're going to have to rip the ball from Wigan's cold, cold, dead hands. <laughs> hey, we're getting into some goth territory. That's that's some MSG shit. Um, it's like but, Charlton. It's like Heston's guns and yeah. Andrew Wiggins in basketball. <laughs> Heston's guns. <laughs> Oh, I enjoy that. <laughs> um, but the other non-basketball reason would be like, right, our um, our viewing of the the thing wrong. Uh, this is dribble bias at its simplest, right? It's like if I was seven feet tall, I would just dunk every time. I'm like, well, what if the seven foot tall guy is better at passing than dunking? It's like, no, you're seven feet tall. You should dunk. And I think that alignment will always exist and that's never going to go away. And I think smart teams can identify what players are good at. There's players like Marcus Gasol, Pau Gasol, um, in particular Jokic. And I don't know if there's something about passing out of the center position that is um, more an emphasis in Europe. I, I'm, I'm just like winging it here, thinking of those two guys. I remember when I would play basketball when I was in Argentina, which is more of like a sort of soccer, far more of a, of a soccer culture, that basketball is played a bit like soccer, where when a big guy would get the ball near the basket, they would have no tr- problem at all or no hesitation in just immediately kicking it back out to above the arc to reset it in a way that big guys here just don't do. To your point, we got the ball doing the paint, now do your thing. They would just immediately kick the ball back out 20 feet, almost to half court, just to restart a possession in the same way that soccer does that. You have no problem in soccer just restarting it. So I wonder if there is sort of a strategic emphasis on that. And I don't think this ties into like fundamentals. I don't think it ties into, you know, learning the game. I'm saying there might be a tie between basketball and soccer in Europe that makes big men look to pass more than immediately just, you know, go into a baby hook or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. You make a good point because the American version of soccer football kind of is a game about committing to a point of view with every play. So if a draw play, of course a runner can run away from blocking, but usually stick to the plan and follow your blockers. And it's almost as if they're putting like a square peg through a round hole every time and with every play. Um, And, in the 90s, even before the NBA was invented in 1996, you saw all these big men trying to force shots through defenders to the rim with dunks and um, getting fouled and this kind of war of attrition in the paint. And we're finally kind of moving away from that after the influence of the 92 Olympics and international ball where there's more grace and more options with every look. That makes sense. And I'm only speaking about Argentina, and it's anecdotal. I played down there, but it was pronounced. I really did notice that big guys looked to pass and were willing to reset in a way that does not happen here. Did you? But, it, but did I was going to say, touch uh, Argentinian one. net. Uh, I had a really bad moment there in Argentina, where we were playing at this like Poli del Portivo, I think it's called. That's probably the incorrect way of saying it but it was like a sports complex that's outdoors and we were playing like pickup ball played for a couple hours and some guy went up and kind of like dunked it and I was like all right let me show these guys that like I can dunk too so I went up and tried to dunk and I missed it of course and kind of pulled on the rim and it ripped it off and at that point I realized that these were wooden backboards and everyone's just like uh dude what the fuck and I had to leave. I'm like, lo siento, lo siento, uh, I'm taking off. And I like remember going back near there a week later or so, and it was still broken, and I felt really, really, really bad. Uh, you created an international incident. Yeah, it was, it was messed up. I still regret it to this day. I did not even rip on it that hard, but it was just a wooden backboard. And in my mind, you know, you can always pull on a rim a little bit, and that shit just like rip right off. Does that mean Argentinian... YMCA ballers don't want it enough because no one's throwing it down like Big Taj. Yeah, like I don't think Nocioni even wants it or <laughs> wanted it. <laughs> but yeah, it's not an exclusive Argentinian thing. A lot of 
these international players play a more fluid game like I just think of Spain <laughs> Spain <laughs> <laughs> the good ones <laughs> uh, tapas <laughs> but it also might just be a total anomaly because we're talking about a small sample size, right? For sure. For Where sure. the Gasols and Jokic happen to be brilliant passers, and there's like a couple of them, and there aren't that many European star centers in NBA history, and those and, happen and, to share a, a, a skill set. And we don't give, say, Joe Kim Noah credit for being a great passer, even though he was a really good passer because he's an American player, and there's a lot of good American centers. Yeah, I love Joakim, but it is a tradition that we decided to continue when we saw Vladi. We're like, oh, and Sabonis. It's like, you guys must all be like that, and they're not. We just see a few of them. Like Boogie Cousins is a very good passer. Anthony Davis is a solid passer. Mm -hmm. And and maybe we're just not giving U.S. guys credit for something that they can do. And it goes back to your point from before that – we teach those guys to go get a bucket versus checking out the floor and trying to find an open guy. So it's less a aptitude issue than like a mentality one. I always think about when Mark Jackson was relieved of his coaching duties in Golden State and Kerr took over and him telling Steph Curry, like, we kind of need you to shoot maybe up to 12 threes a game. And his whole vibe lighting up being like, oh, yeah, that's that's what I love to do. And in the same way, telling a big man, being like, do you like to pass? Like, you, you do you want to create this play? And some players just responding to that in such a positive way. It could even be basketball's version, maybe in the United States, of the cliche about Dominican baseball players where it's like you don't make it off the island by taking walks. That was like that old sort of cliche about why Dominican players – were more free swinging Mm -hmm. and always just looking for contact because no one would pay attention to you if you walked, but they would pay attention to you if you hit a home run or a line drive or whatever. And maybe it's kind of like that with big guys in America where you get, you get attention for dunking on someone. You get attention for scoring points in the paint. You get attention for post moves, but you don't get attention for finding an open three point shooter out of a double team. I mean, this is a problem throughout sports. You're right. Like, contracts aren't built off of protecting rims, even though the people who pay them know that rim protection is probably as valuable, like you said before, as scoring, but it's not perceived the same way. So they could skimp on that cost, and they always have to pay for scoring because people look at points per game more than they look at influencing defensive possessions. Jalil Okafor became the top recruit in the nation, ended up being the number three pick in the draft, off the fact that he was eating up triple teams his entire life. People give him the ball, run as many defenders at him as they felt like, and he would still just get buckets. And that led to his career in the NBA. And when he got to a level where he couldn't abuse defenders like that, or his offensive skill set did not necessarily make up for the fact that he defensively was not a strong player. He didn't have passing abilities to fall back upon because it had never been asked of him. No one at any point in Jaleel Okafor's life as the tallest, biggest, most dominant player that anyone had ever seen on the floor around him was asked to dish the ball. And to be clear, Jaleel Okafor's life has been a smashing success. He made it to the NBA, which is... Not an easy thing to do. He was the number one player in America, arguably. He was the number three pick. He won a national championship. Like, Jaleel Okafor balled the fuck out. He just happens not to be a great contemporary center in the NBA. He ran out of talent at the highest level, and there's no shame in that. He just could right. He couldn't enforce his will in the same way he did at Duke in the NBA. And I would argue that as he's gotten older and maybe now that there's more space on the floor for him to operate, he's become a a better offensive player than he was in the past. And he might, he might be an okay offensive NBA player. I don't think the defense is going to get there, but he's, he was not an utterly disastrous player last season in in the way that he was 
when he was a rookie or, or the, when he was on the nets and never even got on the floor. There's a lane for him for sure. And he's going to hopefully be in the NBA for a while, but you're right. And this, this is the whole, this is the whole idea of this pod today is you want these players to do things that you've seen other players who look like them do before. But Jaleel Okafor is just not the defender. Even someone who looks like Draymond Green is, who is a defensive genius. And then yeah. you, and PJ Washington isn't going to be Draymond Green because there's one J- Draymond Green. Yeah, Okafor is just at this point a typical below average kind of bad NBA player. And yeah. to your point, there's no shame in that whatsoever. That is better than 99.999% of people will ever do in their craft of choice. And even in the field of seven or 6'10 to 7 feet foot tall humans on Earth, Okafor got there, and a lot of these guys don't. Shout out to this affirmation of Jaleel Okafor. The The pro Okafor pod. It took us a while to get here, but <laughs> we made it's it now the, we're now Procofors. It was the jaw friends we made along the way. <laughs> well, we Your really crushed Noel Procofor. <laughs> it's all turned around. The world is topsy turvy, and you know what? It's because we've stopped doing the bit. We've been relieved of the tidbit. We can now just genuinely talk sports instead of making a charade for the likes doing just, it for the eyeballs the the, the clickbait the just attention su- supporting young amazing basketball players because we hate them so much oh can't stand it you know <laughs> when you hate a team what you like to do is say that their players are okay and and don't really need to worry and you don't need to trade them and you don't need to i don't know burn their house down that they'll probably be fine that's what you do when you hate a team you're reluctant to scan it <laughs> Well, that was the perfect pod, as promised. We deliver like Ben Simmons at the, at the arc. <laughs> Is this the bit or not the bit? I don't even know. I would... It's a new bit. It's, it's, it's always, a, we've turned uh, over the bit. We I love cookies. I love cookies. <laughs> it's the other side of the bit coin. Yeah. I love cookies. The cooler side of the bit pillow. All right, let's get out of here. Cookies. Cookies. Cookies.